Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Birds Unplugged. I'm a Sankabe singer, CTO at WSO2. And I'm Seshika Fernando, Vice President of Banking and Financial Services at WSO2. So Seshi, I uh, introduced this concept of uh, digital double in 2016 uh, to represent uh, people, places and uh, things uh, in the digital universe. And interestingly, you authored a paper by connecting digital double and the uh, behavioral authentication. Uh, so I read the entire paper and it was very interesting. Uh, so I would like to start the conversation by asking what made you to uh, author this paper and what was the motivation behind that? Sure. So, you know, I work in, you know, the technology for banking and financial services, right? And I've been doing that for a long time. But the motivation for the paper was actually very, very personal. Um, because it was coming in from the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, we are all consumers. And uh, to me, I noticed that, you know, from all the different experiences that we have uh, from all our service providers, the banking experience, no matter how cool uh, it was, uh, was always falling short of everyone else. Like if you think of uh, like Netflix or Amazon or Uber or, you know, any of these things, the, the banking experience was always a bit more um, uh, sort of detached than that seamless experience you would get in other service providers. Uh, so the, the technology person then started thinking, okay, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized it's because of, you know, obviously it's because of the, the sensitivity of the data, the sensitivity of the business, the regulation, uh, which meant that the experience not only had to be great, but it also meant that it had to be secure, uh, resilient, uh, conforming to regulation. So all of these things actually kind of holds uh, banks back from providing that Netflix-like experience. So then I kind of, you know, started to think about, you know, the digital double world. Uh, and that's where kind of like that light bulb uh, switched on for me. And I realized that you can still have a very secure, uh, robust uh, experience, um, which is very close to, uh, you know, the Amazon-like or the Netflix-like experience if you actually used the data uh, that 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 makes the core of that digital double uh, in a secure way. So that's where everything began. I think that's interesting because it's always good to find solutions for real problems <laughs> rather than we are adding noise. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, you are correct because even I notice there's a lag uh, from the experience point of view as well as how the technology utilize in the uh, banking and financial sector uh, so bringing these type of concepts as well as make it uh, more uh, uh, I mean uh, empower the creation of these experiences inside the uh, financial domain is a great way uh, so and there's another interesting uh, thing in this paper you combined two concepts one, the digital double coming from one side, representing all these uh, digital assets and people. On the other side, you uh, brought the behavioral authentication uh, into the same scenario as well. So how uh, does these two connect? And then uh, uh, what's the combination? Mm. Yeah, so Asanka, I mean, currently, if you look at how banks do authentication, I mean, think of the, the cool banks, right, who do authentication a little better than everyone else, the average bank. Um, it's still um, it's still a very user-driven process, isn't it? Like, you know, we, we talk about multi-factor authentication where we use, you know, different aspects of the consumer, what they are, what they have, what they know uh, to um, authenticate someone. And, and most banks have moved on to, you know, biometric, using biometrics for it. Uh, but it's still, you know, coming from the user. The user still has to stop in their tracks and, you know, like stare at the camera or, you know, look the other way and smile. Or, you know, they have to still do something or provide some information to, to for the system to verify that it's really the person that is supposed to be doing that transaction, right? So this is 
this is what was really kind of you know not that great for me so the reason i kind of thought of these two concepts is the digital double is about the digital assets right it's about data that has been collected about a, a user a consumer for a long period of time and that data is not just you know something they know something they are it's like very rich data about you know how they behave right uh, so that is that's the that's where the, the the data comes in and then what do you do with that data to securely make sure so to, to really make sure that um, this is that person without having to interrupt them uh, in their banking journey is where you apply the algorithms to that data uh to really make sure that this is uh who should be you know doing this transaction without having to stop them in their tracks so that's where the two concepts came together and then of course um it became really beautiful because uh it was like this you know cycle because you would use that data and do that uh sort of apply the algorithms and do that authentication and then because the consumer is not stopped uh in their in their you know whatever they were doing you know you generate much more rich data so then it it then adds on to the digital double so it you know it goes in a very nice cycle yeah great you use this word the cool bank uh, so when uh, i hear that always my mind goes to capital one uh, so my kids they still don't believe it's a bank they say it's a cafe Uh, because of the experience and the uh, look and feel that uh, they have there, uh, yeah. so I think uh, the the uh, uh, so my interesting thing that you said uh, about how you provide a rich uh, digital experience but uh, more secure. So yeah. these two goes in two ways, right? Like uh, how you can yeah. have. Security as well as how you can have a rich experience. Yeah. So from a uh, implementation point of view mm. uh, how we can find the balance mm. and where's the balance mm. so i think uh this balance is what everyone is like trying to i mean everyone's trying to find that right balance right so when it's a user driven uh authentication scenario or mechanism or that's what you have it will always be a balance because uh user driven authentication depends on interrupting the user for some sort of information right whether they type it whether they whether they are what it is you know whatever uh, the authentication mechanism is it still stops the user right so that's why this balance comes into place because when you have to interrupt the user you are compromising on the experience right but by interrupting the user at various points when they are trying to do um some sort of you know important uh, financial transaction you are actually making sure that at every point this is the right guy doing the doing this transaction right so when you increase uh, the 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 security or the robustness of that authentication then you slightly compromise on the experience whereas in the in the behavioral authentication using the digital du- double scenario it doesn't have to be a balance right because um this behavioral this authentication depends on data and vast amounts of data right so for us to uh authenticate someone based on their behaviors you need that person to generate a lot of data right so so let's start with data available so there's some data available uh about the user and then the authentication the, the the idea of behavioral authentication is that the authentication happens in the background while the user is transacting with the system right is this how the user normally transacts with the system is this where they usually log in from like that kind of information so it's it's authenticating while you are using so as a result you are not interrupted so therefore it's like netflix right you keep watching and watching and watching <laughs> right so uh the consumers banking consumers can keep doing what they are doing checking out new things checking out new investments all of that without you know getting interrupted so that then generates more data right so then it goes in that nice virtuous cycle where you know authentication in the background generates more data and the and the 
data that gets generated in turn makes a much richer authentication scenario. And one other thing is that because authentication happens in the background, the system can actually authenticate a user at any point. Right? Whereas in the user-driven world, you have to be very careful uh, to figure out where do we really want extra authentication. So that's where this whole thing, I see it as a virtuous cycle because you know you can authenticate at any time. And the more you do it, the, the better the experience is and then that generates more data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think now there are uh, like, uh, it's about data, uh, information and insights. And mm. then uh, you spoke about the data within the ecosystem, the banking mm. ecosystem. Mm. But then again, uh, uh, I think to mm. provide a better experience, uh, you need to capture data outside that ecosystem as well. Mm. Uh, then you need integration. And then mm. like uh, uh, coming from like uh, other industries and then other domains, that's a main challenge uh, from the technology point of view, uh, mm. as well as from the cultural uh, mm. uh, point of view as well. Uh, so like uh, coming from a uh, BFSI background by knowing how the uh, inside work inside these institutes, mm. uh, how do you see like uh, 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 what are the kind of uh, best practices or uh, how you can overcome those challenges uh, that you see when it comes to integration? Yeah. So Asanka, when you look at the spectrum of banks, uh, there are still a large um, portion of banks who, have who still have integration problems even within, hmm. right? So we're talking about integrating to other ecosystems, but even within, uh, there is still a large, uh, a significant chunk of banks uh, who still have different systems to do different things, right? So integration, actually, when we talk about it, we just start from there. Are, you, are we integrating from within and are we uh, sort of leveraging all the data that we have about a user within the banking ecosystem, right? Uh, of course, you know, we are in the business of integration, so, you know, that's our bread and butter, right? So we, we help organizations integrate very, very easily, very quickly, uh, especially, uh, you know, using APIs, right? Exposing APIs and, uh, you know, integrating that way through APIs. Um, so actually, the, the, the part to do within the bank is very easy. It's just that, you know, you know banks just need to get it done. Uh, Integrating with external ecosystems, I would say about five, six years ago, uh, was still like, like a very nervous thing for banks, right? It's, it was like the time where, you know, banks were scared of the cloud, right? Uh, but with the introduction of, you know, open banking as regulation, right? It kind of uh, made it cool and made it okay to open up uh, to, you know, different different partners, different, um, different industries, right? So that was a very interesting time for me in the banking sector where, you know, always over, over time, it's been regulation that has been kind of dragging banks back, right? Uh, and kind of banks have also used regulation sometimes as, a, as an excuse uh, to not innovate to not do certain things because you know they're worried that it will um, violate regulation but open banking was where regulators came in and said you know what you guys uh, you have to open up right so that then became this api economy then for in the banking sector became like very common and and very banks kind of started losing that nervousness so now that we are already in there and, and open banking is worldwide right whether it's regulated or not now I think the time is right and, you know, open banking has been around for, for, for many years, tried and tested now. So now I think it's, it's, it's the prime time to make use of, um, you know, this data across the, the larger ecosystem. Uh, and I think now, even though you've been talking about digital double from 2016, now is like the, the prime time to really see that coming together. Yeah, I think you answered the uh, technology and standard 
part of uh, the problem. Uh, but I would like to a little bit uh, get more insight about the people and culture part. Ah. Because as a strategic uh, consultant, uh, this is where I get stuck uh, most of the time on how we can uh, uh, get going and then transform the culture and the uh, people's mm. mindset. Mm. And I'm sure that challenge is still there in the uh, banking and financial sector as well. Uh, so any insight from you, from your experience uh, working with these institutes? Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, that's very important, right? And thanks for kind of, you know, flagging that. Um, so, Asante, like, I have a very different way of looking at the, the culture part, right? Obviously, um, it, it's, it's also scary for the people to tell the bank, you know, share my financial data with someone else. Right? Who would want to do that? Right? Um, but I look at it from, you know, like an Uber experience. Right? We ask, we allow Uber to know our location, which is a very private, personal thing. Right? We allow Uber to know our location in order to get a ride. Right? Similarly, uh, we have allowed so many different service providers to read very private information. We have given them access to our camera right? um, in order to get a certain experience. And it's the same in banking, right? Uh, if you show consumers what you can get out of an ex uh, as an experience, uh, if you share this data with someone, uh, that is one part of the problem solved. The other part of the problem and the more important part is to uh, show consumers how you can control that sharing of data. Because at the end of the day, you are absolutely on top of who gets your data, for what purpose, for how long, and you can change your mind also, right? You, you, you decide to share your data with someone and then you realize for, for various reasons, okay, this is not turning out really great for me or I don't enjoy this experience anymore, you can, sh you can stop that. So the open API economy comes with a lot of power for the consumer. So the more the banks can show that to the consumer, uh, create awareness to the consumer about that, uh, the more people kind of start using it. So it's two things. One is how much they can control and how much they really benefit out of sharing that data. Yeah, I think uh, uh, you kind of uh, gave a really good answer. Uh, and and I, I put this in um, this way, like I call it as uh, four E's. Um, mm. in empower, engage, entrust, and enable. Mm. Uh, so uh, within the organization as well as uh, uh, outside the organization, uh, sometimes help to... Uh, uh, do this cultural transformation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we spoke about uh, uh, the current situation mm -hmm. and uh, where this is heading to. Uh, mm -hmm. So any predictions about uh, the future? Because there's a lot of things happening, right, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, so how do you think uh, these concepts will get evolved as well as uh, provide more and more benefit for the end user as well as uh, for the uh, uh, financial institutes? Um, predictions is, is, uh, <laughs> is a very tough thing, uh, but I have hopes. <laughs> so my hope is that, uh, and I'm sure it's the same for you, the, the concept of digital double actually really starts to kind of really work out. Because if you really think about it, I mean, there is a digital version of us, but currently there are many digital versions of us, right? Siloed across different service providers. So my hope is that this becomes, you know, one entity, right? Yeah. Which means um, my experience across the board, my experience across different uh, service providers, different aspects of my lifestyle becomes um, unified. Right. So from a technology angle, that means data is shared across the board and that identity is, is, is one identity across the board. 
so the day that happens then you know the 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 possibilities are endless right because for me that means then it's everything is then it's it's connected your your lifestyle and the the banking products that is required to do that is is just so, so for me that's the experience that uh, i am hoping for and longing for and and helping banks understand what technology they need to achieve that it's it's already within us it's just that everyone has to come together be disciplined uh, and and achieve that for their consumers Yeah I think there's a role uh for the private sector as well as uh, the uh public sector as well right to get this uh, identity unification and then have mm. unique identity for uh, each and every person uh mm. so that's key uh, and I think uh, I touch based on this uh, a little bit in my paper as well about uh, uh moving from this uh, geocentric uh, uh identities to more heliocentric identity management uh, what uh, it means i think you touch based on that as well uh now uh, without giving full control to the identity provider how mm. the user will take back the control and then uh, provide consent uh, for each and every service provider based on how much they trust and mm. then what type of a service that uh, they would like to uh, get from that particular service provider will uh, 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 be very helpful and mm. then uh, future prediction wise i think uh, this uh, uh, unified identity but it will be more of a distributed identity mm. in the future and there are good uh, movements happening with uh, web 3.0 like uh, this identity mesh or i uh, like identity fabric type of concepts that mm. we might be able to utilize uh, and from the business point of view say she i think uh, uh, we are coming to the uh, top of the hill of this experience economy and i was thinking what is next uh, so mm. i i think uh, the next uh, movement will be a value economy because uh, you provide a lot of experiences and now mm. how you can generate more and more value for the mm. all stakeholders of the organization the employees and then the uh, partners as well as their customers so with that uh, we can take uh, these uh, experiences into the next level and generate more and more value and i think in that particular scenario digital double will play a huge role by uh, representing all these assets inside the digital world and um, uh, from one side this web 3.0 type of things are coming one side ai is coming and yeah. from the other side the metaverse is coming but uh, this concept will be a central piece of everything uh, so that's what i think and then uh, after reading your paper i was thinking more towards this uh, uh, value side of the uh, Uh, equation as well i i really like that uh, asanka that that value economy that's really great right because when i was writing the paper actually i hadn't thought of that uh, i was thinking of you know improving the experience because in the banking sector there is far more to be improved but i really like that concept because when you actually combine the value economy to the experience then that experience becomes about the value that you create for the consumer right so that's the end game really and there's no point in just working on experience if there is no value to be you know reaped at the end of it so i i, I really like that concept i hope you write about it yeah actually i'm in the process of writing it uh, ah, right. uh, so still kind of uh, putting the thoughts together uh, yeah okay. so something will come up uh, soon looking forward to that <laughs> great thanks and i think uh, uh, your paper is there to get yeah. more insight about this um, any other recommendation for somebody who's new to the concept uh, uh, or would like to get uh, more information about uh, this concept yeah so actually in the writing the paper uh, took a bit of a process right because now this was in my head but it was important for us to kind of touch base with actual you know banking executives uh to un- like ctos you know people working in you know apis 
uh, API programs, you know, fraud prevention within banks. So we actually did a lot of groundwork before I started writing the paper or in the process of writing the paper. So there are a couple of um, articles, uh, you know, Phoenix Tri interviewed a, a bunch of us, uh, myself and, and some uh, banking uh, C-suite executives. Uh, there's a interview uh, by Finextra. We have another interview with, you know, Chris Skinner, who's, you know, one of uh, the biggest influencers in the banking technology space. So there are a bunch of stuff. I think I, we can make the links available. Uh, but there are a lot of, you know, precursors to the paper that will kind of uh, set the stage. And then the, the paper is uh, there to kind of talk about really how it's done. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to kind of write about it. And there are couple of stuff that's coming up in the next couple of weeks and months as well. Great. And thanks, Eshi, for uh, taking my concept to the next level, uh, as well as uh, uh, taking time to have this conversation as well. And I am uh, looking forward to read more uh, articles and then uh, uh, more content about the, this concept as well. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks, Asanka, for, you know, like I always feed off of your concepts, right? So the next step is going to be, you know, I'm going to wait for your value experience article and then improve this side of things. So, you know, it'll be a continuous journey. And thanks for the opportunity to have this chat. Thanks, everybody. And uh, uh, hopefully catch you in another episode of uh, Words Unplugged. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,